In this week's episode, I'm speaking to Molly Bloom, dubbed the Poker Princess, the former waitress who took a small poker game run out of a dingy nightclub to become the biggest underground poker game in the world, involving Hollywood actors to billionaires. After I stood up to one of the Billionaire Boys Club members and started my own game, and then it became the game in Hollywood, and I was making millions of dollars. He came into my apartment, he put a gun in my mouth, and then he said, I know where your family lives. Then it was just like rapid fire, like everything was falling apart. Part. After the feds raided one of my games that I wasn't at, my account balance read negative nine million. So welcome back to another episode of Uncut and Uncensored. And I'm like, look, I've got the spring in my step. I'm so excited to have the gorgeous Molly Bloom on the show. I have waited a long time to interview you. Welcome. <laughs> I mean, well, for those of you that are living under a rock and haven't don't, don't know who Molly is, um, Molly is the um, well, the, the the story of Molly's game and the high poker stakes games that she used to run for. Um, I don't even know how you uh, high stake game holders. Now I'm fascinated because I watched the movie and went crazy for it and became fascinated by you. So you, you and I just think it's an amazing story and what a power bitch you are. <laughs> That is well, a power I bitch move. A huge compliment coming from you. Thank you. So I, you've got to take me back, Molly. Like, because how old were you when this all happened? So I was twenty-four, and I had just retired from my ski career. I was skiing for the U.S. ski team, and you know, had kind of spent my childhood up until that point obsessed this with game. this sport and sacrificing everything. You know, I didn't even drink on my 21st birthday. Like I was in, you know, I was trying to do school and get good grades. And then also every summer go train in the Southern hemisphere or a place where it, it was winter again. So when I abruptly retired from skiing, I was just reeling. And I, I said to my parents, I just need a year off and I wanna go somewhere where it's summer the whole year, every day, sunny, you know? And they said, well, we think you should go to law school and we don't think you should take a break. And I said, well, I'm going. And I guess the closest place I could get to on, you know, a couple of tanks of gas was LA. I mean, I have to, and I, I have to just mm -hmm. stop you for two seconds. Because first of all, getting to the US ski team in itself shows your dedication you know, the prowess of like not giving up. And I think, you know, we've all sort of got glamorized the next part of your life, but actually getting even, you know, the first part of your life too, becoming a sportsman to that level shows such dedication and, and which a lot of people um, don't have. My, hu my husband has it to be an athlete to, to that standard. I can't even imagine the hours and the sort of um, the balls that you have to have throwing yourself off a mountain at that age too. Uh, it's scary. And I wanted to ask you as well, after everything, are your parents proud or? Uh, endlessly. Endlessly. Even, it, like yeah. all the way through, because it's quite an incredible but, story. No, 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 not all the way through. Not all no. the way through. So, and maybe not for the reasons that you would think. Um, I grew up with real people, real values. Um, you know, my mom was, I think, just used all of life's opportunities to teach us about morality and moral courage and integrity. And my dad um, was very much about the pursuit of excellence and discipline, which he called constructive suffering. <laughs> you know, I'd be like doing my math homework, complaining, and he's like, but you're suffering constructively, you know? And, um, and, you know, but, but character is a big deal. So when I started doing, running these games and it seemed like it was going to be a, a permanent thing and I would come home with all this cash and a Bentley and like, they were like, yes, but what are you doing with your life? Like, what, what is this? And, you know, if you can tell us like how it's aligned with your purpose that you've always felt you had in life. And, you know, then, then we're all for it. But so where they became endlessly proud is in the reinvention. I think when I say they're endlessly proud, they're endlessly proud at 
the fact that I returned home, like metaphorically and now geographically, um, after being in those worlds. And, and to me there, you know, it was an adventure and an exploration, but it did turn me into someone eventually that I didn't know who I was and I no longer respected. And, and we can get into that. Um, but I was going to say, was it worth really it? Fun. I was going to say, was it worth it? So it was a great adventure and it taught me so much about risk and about um, standing up to power and this, that you truly are, if you're willing to like get out there and take risks and, and not be fragile when things don't work out, like you can truly architect the most improbable life. Um, and, and I think probably like you've experienced that too, where you, you just have to go for it and, and going for it has a lot to do with managing the mind. But yeah, in the beginning, after I, you know, stood up to one of the, to my boss, to one of the, you know, billionaire boys club members and, started my own game and then it became the game in Hollywood and I was making millions of dollars. And a lot of times it was in cash and I was like, you know, jumping on the bed with a million dollars in cash. And I was 24, 25 years old. And all my, you know, I brought all my girlfriends along and they would, I would find odd jobs for them at the games and we were traveling and I had this insane network and I was learning about the world from some of the people who were Truly See, the crazy thing is my hair's gone on end. I want I want to come with you already. I'm like, I'm the girl that would have gone, I'm in, let's go. Oh we would have been so dangerous together. <laughs> I I we love you. See, that right that now. I I mean, I know it's dangerous and I know it's like not I mean, you know, but honestly, I think it's fucking fabulous. Like, I wish there were more people like you. And obviously there are bits that got dark eventually. Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think seeing the story and I, meeting you now that it, you know, that you could ever have foreseen where it was going. It just seemed like a good at idea at the time. And you became a victim of yeah. circumstance more and more and more as you got into it. And I understand that. Yes. Um, you know, I think I had a lot of enemies because um, I was almost instantly more successful, both in LA and New York than, than people who had been doing it for 20 years and, and men. And it was really because um, I focused on the human being, you know, and I realized I, I have, my father's a psychologist and growing up, that's a total nightmare, but, um, but it does. And now it's like incredible. You know, I have my therapist, 24 seven and I use it <laughs> like, and he always answers the phone, but we grew up thinking about how humans work and really trying to understand what's underneath the behavior. Like what is the unconscious drive here or what's the nuance? And so I realized quickly on that it was more than just poker. It was escapism and fantasy and a place where these people who kind of couldn't lose in the real world anymore, it was, it was equalized again and it was an escape from their life. And so, um, when I, when I fixed, when I, when I learned about that and I started to build out these, build out this brand and build out these rooms and these experiences and try to have everyone feel like James Bond for the night and have no, you know, like the, the amazing like return on investment that comes from just knowing the details and remembering the details of someone's life is so incredible. Like I remember, you know, really early on, I would, we would have this like little book and it was everyone's favorite drink order, their food order, the notes from the game the previous week and, and just, you know, like instructions on how to listen and not listen to respond, but listen to discover. And, you know, just like these little things that make people feel seen, heard, and remembered. And these people in that room couldn't be more seen, heard, and remembered, but it wasn't authentic. You know, it's not this authentic thing where 
And truthfully, neither was mine, right? It, it was transactional, but I, for most of my career, I authentically cared about these people. And I mean, and I, and I still do, and I still care about human beings in general. Like I got that from my mom. And so because I didn't focus on the way that things were being done, but I leaned into like a different perspective that I had, um, you know, I, I was really successful and that won me a lot of enemies and some of them very dangerous. What was the most frightening consequence to that that you that happened to you? You know, I think a lot of people would think getting beaten up by that guy from the mob. Yeah. Um, How did you survive that? <sighs> anger. I was so like, I was, well, first, he came into my apartment. He put a gun in my mouth. Oh I'll God. never forget that feeling like my teeth were chattering because I was somatically like terrified. And I just, I was trying so hard to not like to, to still my jaw because I was so worried it was going to go off. So, you know, that moment was absolutely terrifying. Um, he beat me up. That was terrible. And he really looked like he was enjoying this, this power. And then he said, I know where your family lives. Oh and God. then I was just like, you know, I, and I couldn't tell anyone and I couldn't call the cops because they told me if, if you tell anyone and if you don't partner with us, then we know where your family lives in Colorado. And after he left, I was terrified and I was alone and I was depressed and I was bloody and it was terrible. But as the days went by. Why did he leave, by the way? Why did they let you go? Oh, so well, this is... In, in my string of bad luck that was that year, this was the only good luck. Um, so after he left, I, Caroline, I had no idea what I was going to do. Like the stakes of this thing had gotten so high. I never expected this to happen. I don't know why. I was naive. But my games were at the plaza with the New York Yankees. I just, you know. But I, again, I was super naive. And so I you were twenty. To be fair, you were 24 years old. <laughs> Well, how, how could you by, see by that? This, yeah, I mean, by this time I was not, I was thirty, and I had learned some hard lessons. But still, you know, I was a kid from a small yeah. town. You know, New York City was a, a, a long was way away. I had no, I had no idea. Um, but so day five, I get the New York Times, and I'm still like trying to figure this thing out. And on the cover, it said. 125 arrested in the biggest mob related takedown in New York City history. Oh shit. And so I never heard from them again. Oh my God, they've all gone to prison. They all got picked up. But do you worry that they're gonna get out? No, because they actually made a movie about how I'm not a rat. <laughs> oh great. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but you ask me how I got through that. I was just I was so irate that somebody that's like such a loser and like such a terrible person could walk into my apartment, first of all, get up, like somehow like everyone's for sale, you know, um, even though like I would just hand out hundred dollar bills to my doorman like every day, um, get up to my apartment, come in with a gun. I'm five foot three, like 115 and beat and beat me up and stick a gun in my mouth and look like he was enjoying it. And then, and then come for my family, like threaten my family. I was so effing pissed. And, and so sometimes people will say, well, you know, there's, you need to examine what's under that anger. And for me, it was fuel because I just became so sure that I would not let that guy have any power over me ever again. And and that's just kind of like, that's how I moved through it. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna say that I'm not still wary when I see men on the street, big men, whatever. But, you know, I, I can challenge the thoughts and I can, you know, kind of bring in rationality. And, and it's all because like that guy, that guy doesn't get any say 
over my life. My you God. Know? I mean, the strength it takes for that kind of thing. And I think, you know, I think where all this is, is that, you know, something that started so innocently can lead <laughs> to, you know, I mean, I, I don't think anyone could think a poker game would lead to all of these things. But you Never. did, you disrupted a male a male dominated world and an underground world and you disrupted yeah. it and made it, you know, sexy. You made it something that people wanted to be part of. As you said, you know, it's funny because that is a big lesson in any business. It is the, um, the business of people, people buy from people, right. people don't mm -hmm. buy from businesses. And I've That's always right. said that. And you know, when you're dealing with people, it's, it's going that little bit further for somebody, then you'll keep them. And that's clearly, even though it was, you know, uh, it, directed into a poker game that most people will never be part of, it is valuable lessons for people in any industry what you're talking about and I a hundred percent have been on the other end of that I'm I, I'm a big believer in service and, and what you're talking about remembering the little things and you know you are a woman and you are like you know something like this to disrupt an industry like that is just mind-blowing it's mind-blowing I mean I don't think what was the lady that did um had the uh, she disrupted sort of like um the, the prostitution ring in a way it was all always oh, yeah yes place yeah. Right? was it, her name was Heidi Fleiss yeah Heidi Fleiss that's it it's this one powerful bitch in the middle of all of it I mean it's quite how do you feel that you've become such a sort of I don't know name like everywhere everyone does know who you are now for it yeah I mean it's like, it's weird. It, it, it's not a part of my everyday life. You know, I moved back to Colorado. I have a two year old. Um, I, my family's here. I go for hikes. Like I have this normal life until I go on the road and, and make a speech or come on, you know, your podcast or something. And, um, are you able to do that? I like how, how do you go from a hundred miles an hour? You see, that's the thing for me. Like, I need the high octane life, you know, all the time. I need to be this crazy. And like yours was on another level to even that. Like how the fuck do you go from the New York Yankees yeah. to doing the game and being the most famous poker game in the world to going to Colorado and climbing a mountain with your two-year-old every day? Ooh, that is a very good and very pivotal question. Um, first of all, I think it took me losing absolutely everything. Um, I think it took the mob, the FBI, like the, you know, I, it took everything. I mean, so af after the confrontation with the, the mobster, um, then it was just like rapid fire, like everything was falling apart. It came out in LA because one of the guys was running a Ponzi scheme and we all got sued for the money that he lost in the game. And so now the tabloids are covering it. Um, turns out that some of my bigger, these bigger players were running the biggest insurance fraud scheme in New York City history. The feds were listening to their phones. They threw this confidential informant in the game. Um, and, you know, and then in, I got a text message later that year from someone that was working my game. And these games were huge. Can you hear yourself? Like how, like, are you, are you married now? Um, divorced. Divorced. Like, but, but we're best friends. How on earth do you explain this to people? I mean, because, because. <laughs> Thankfully there's a movie. Well, there's a movie. Yes, you're right. But like, I mean, even just, I, I don't know how you go back to normal life. Like how, it's like re-entering a completely different world and just trying to switch that world off. The movie must have just blown everything up anyway. But, you know, one one obviously what you did in one way was illegal and is illegal and all of these things. But on the mm -hmm. other way, you're just everyone's just mesmerized by it. Right. Because, you know, yeah. it, you became one of the most powerful women there was. And to do that and then to go back, as you just said, to to a normal world, completely living with your parents, having lost everything like everything uh, uh, how how does yeah. uh, do, do, how do you like how do you get used to not having the money you used to have and like not the cars yeah. and the 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 jewelry or the i don't know the stuff that i mean 
I've lost, a, you know, been up and down and mm. lost a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but like, and I realize you don't need all the jewelry and everything else. But I, I yeah. do want the, the, the life. I can't know that not the lifestyle. I need the life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess what happened was, so the feds, I looked at my bank account, like after the feds raided one of my games that I wasn't at and and my account balance read negative nine million. Wow. And then I got <laughs> home. <laughs> Where was it I before? And I mean, also like the amount of money that was owed to me on the street. I mean, it, it was a, it was a big number and it was. But where I, was it before the negative nine million? What was it positive? It was a, around there. Okay. Um, so there's like certain contingencies to my plea agreement that I'm like not allowed okay. to get no specific financials, but you know, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I was getting tipped two to 5% of people's wins and there were games where people were losing a hundred million dollars a night. So I, I mean, I was making a stupid amount of money and I had, I filed my taxes. So like, you know, like I was making $6 million a year on my tax return. So you did, you uh, did everything legitimately really. Uh, yeah. Until the end, until the end, until yeah. the end where everything was just falling apart. And, and I was just probably like self-destructing. Was that greed? But, so do you like, think? greed mm -hmm. did you get greedy that's what blew you up because that I can understand that sometimes you wouldn't get more you want more 100%. and more yeah so not only did I get greedy but when you get greedy in a business like this you have to make these moral decisions that kept me up at night and you know for most of my poker running career I really do think the fact that I was trustworthy that I took care of people that I cared about their humanity gave me an incredible edge. Um, but if, you know, if you lay with dogs long enough, you're going to wake up with fleas. Like that's mm -hmm. just the deal. And so I was in this very degenerate world and I let the money and the power get to me. And I also started making decisions like putting people in games that I knew maybe didn't have the money or if they had a big loss that, you know, they they would be in trouble. Maybe their family would be in trouble. And when I started making choices like that, it seemed, it just seemed like, you know, then I would make another choice that was a little left of center. And, and, then, and then pretty soon I woke up and I didn't even know who I was anymore. Like I just, I, you know, I, I was, I always had edge and I always was a bit of a rebel and, you know, was kind of fearless, but I did it with like heart, you know, and all of a sudden the only thing I cared about or the only thing that I demonstrated that I cared about through my actions was probably my dog and money and status power. And so, well, you won't be um, the first and you're not going to be the last. Yeah. And you know what? Like, so this is what I learned. So I, I, I had to go back and live with my mom and I was so humiliated and people would whisper about me. And when I would go to, you know, see my best friend in, in LA or whatever. And, and so I was so miserable inside, so miserable. Cause I also got sober um, because I was towards the end, I was just really taking a lot of pills and drinking. So all of a sudden here I am completely sober, faced with this incredible mess, feeling everything that I did not want to feel, which was shame and anxiety and like this deep pit of fear that like, I will never, get out of this hole and embarrassment. And a couple of things happened during that time. And it was two years. Um, first of all, I started meditating a lot. And what meditation eventually allowed me to do was to pay less attention to the negative mind states and to be able to kind of find a place of presence so in the present moment, anything's possible. In the past, nothing is possible. You can't change anything. Yeah. And the future is like pure speculation. So in a meditation practice, at least the kind that I do, you train your focus. You put your, you put your focus on the breath and then the mind starts going and you just label it thinking and then you bring it back to the breath. And so it's like training a muscle. And so that was one thing that I did incredibly well is I was just 
I was so miserable that I was willing to do whatever it took. Um, I, you know, there are some, some elements of the 12 steps that are so brilliant. Uh, I went and I made amends to anyone that I'd ever hurt. Um, I accepted responsibility for all of it. Like I had to fully own that this situation I was in was a hundred percent my fault. I had lawyers, we had found a loophole. I had, you know, the most loyal clients. I had great parents. I had all this opportunity and here I was, right? And so that was the first thing I had to do. And then the second thing I had to do was probably one of the most powerful things that I've ever done. And I really think more women should do it on a regular basis. I fucking forgave myself. You know yes. what I mean? Like I, I forgave myself. And, and, you know, like the, the sort of like trade-off was I'm going to stand for the responsibility in my actions. I'm going to own all this. I'm going to do whatever I can to make it right. And then I'm going to forgive myself. And the way that I had to do that was I had to challenge the voices that told me not to. I had to go to war with those voices, the voices that said like, you're finished, you, you know, nothing's ever good coming your way again. You're a joke. You're an embarrassment. And I had to, you know, have words with those voices and like re-narrate that. And so this taught me so much about how critical it is to start to have some agency over what happens in your head. Change Otherwise your you're just getting taken for a ride, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there is also this moment of, cause I had always cared what everyone thought. My brother is a, you know, my middle brother is a Harvard educated cardiothoracic surgeon at Massachusetts General. Uh, my youngest brother is a two-time Olympian NFL player who was an Abercrombie model. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even the pretty one in the family, you know? <laughs> like, and, and has started, you know, charity in his hometown and our hometown granting wishes for. Oh my God. So what do they think so, of all this? What's that? What do they think of you? Like, how do they feel about it? I mean, they, we love each other dearly and they're like, you know, they, we just it's unconditional no but like in oh. it were they did they have any idea at the time yeah are you kidding me they loved coming out oh okay so they loved you the at the time you were like the, the cool thing yeah. yeah okay i was like okay I'll, I'll hire you for security like i don't know oh my god um yeah they 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 had the best time uh, now towards the end when it was getting darker they were like you gotta this get is out. enough yeah. Um, but you know, I just, I cared so much about what people thought and I wanted my dad and my mom to be proud of me. Like they were proud of my brothers. So this was the worst, like I, it, the tablets were covering it, you know? And then there was this moment of like, man, I, I'm kind of free though. You know, like I failed so spectacularly when it was all said and done. I was a convicted felon, millions of dollars in debt, social pariah, you know, you know, those scenes, like once you've like been sort of canceled or whatever, you walk into a room and everyone whispers and you, but then there's just like this moment of, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like it matters what my family think. It matters what I think inside. It matters what kind of person I'm striving to be and you know what Molly mostly these people okay I mean like okay forget the dark bit and I always think there's a time in business where you have to jump but the people that judge are the people that think holy shit she's kind of cool like there are bits obviously that were wrong I don't get me wrong and yeah. you know that yeah, yeah. you don't we don't want to teach people that you know to go out and start doing this but you know, at the end yeah. of the day, there's there's lots of businesses uh, that, uh, that people walked willingly into your game, put it that way. And um, yeah. they weren't forced to sit there. It is what it is. Yeah. And, um, you know, there'll be poker games after you and there's poker games before you. You just went down bigger. But, um, you know, I think the powerful thing about this is the transformation. And when people judge you like that, and when you walk into a town where people want to say that, you know, you failed and you did, it, well, yes and no. You know, you're now um, a massive Hollywood story. You know, you failed, as you said, with heart, but it, it didn't fail, it came to an end. 
actually it could have gone mm -hmm. on. It's just, you know, you got you got overwhelmed as from what I'm hearing. Yeah. It became too big for, for sure. you. And and at yeah, the end of the, it, yeah. It wasn't sustainable. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It became too big for you. And I defy anyone to be in your situation and not get greedy. And, you know, the, the thing that, you know, you were a young girl that got grew up into this and to see that kind of wealth and to be able to have disposable income like that, where you can just mm -hmm. hand it out to people. And it happens in many different places. You know, we don't, it may not be a poker game now, but crypto's kind of the same sort of world in a way. Uh -huh. And so it still exists and there'll be more people like, like you. Always. So, you know, and, and, and I think the powerful message is what you are doing to change yourself and have been able to and what you've learned and you know people directly losing um their wealth or their money or you know the in the in a game that you held or taking accountability for that is amazing but at the same time vegas exists you know what are you going to do people th these people are going to do it regardless of whether you were going to do it so i love that you've taken responsibility for your own actions but it's sometimes yes. in the in the world you know people putting everything on you I do feel it's like you know that is comes from people being scared to jump out of their box especially from places yeah. like you know small towns where we've all grown up everybody wants mm -hmm. to see people fail because if you yeah. had made that the most successful thing in the world and you were still going then why haven't they and that's the problem mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And there's just such freedom in letting people have their own journey and letting people have their own opinions and, you know, still trying to have some grace about it. Um, you know, I did two things following that. One felt really like I served uh, my, not only my integrity, but, um, you know, sort of the, the, took care of people in the end, the prosecutors of the Southern District, which is a very ambitious prosecutorial office, uh, sent 17 FBI agents with machine guns to my apartment two years after I had, you know, exited the scene. And they put this piece of paper in front of me that said the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. And I was involved in this very serious fe uh, federal indictment with some very serious criminals that I'd never heard of in my life. And um, the prosecutors wanted a meeting and, and it, then it became clear why all the shenanigans. They wanted me to become a confidential informant. They weren't interested in the mobsters or the guys running the insurance fraud scheme. They wanted inside information and leads on politicians, billionaires, and Hollywood people. And I always say like, if there was an Epstein in my game, he wouldn't have had to threaten me at all. I would have I would have told you everything like preemptively. But what they wanted information on is like who's running sports books and New York was going to legal legalize it the following year. They made more in a month than like Vegas did in a year. So it was more along the lines of these crimes that uh, I didn't feel like we're doing real harm. Um, and so, you know, even though they offered to give me all my money back and to give me a deferred prosecution, if I was willing to flip, um, I ultimately ended up turning their offer down. And I did it because they had families. I did it because I didn't believe in the mission of this particular prosecutor. I thought it was completely self-interested and wanted, you know, big flashy indictments on, on the front page of the newspaper. And I did it to reclaim something that I was really important to me, which was my terms. You know, no, my my soul is no longer for sale. Um, doesn't mean I don't like money. Doesn't mean I don't like nice things. But I'm not. I'm not ever straying from who I am again, for for external things. And then. After I did that, like, I got that, you know, because I've always had this delusional confidence. I feel like kind of like you have the same thing. Like, yeah, I'm going to figure that out. Like, I'm going to make that work. <laughs> like, there's who's going to stop me, right? Like, no one. And, and and I feel like you have that same like, vibe. Mm -hmm. And I lost it for a while. 
And then after I stood up to those prosecutors and, you know, I got it back. And so after I pled guilty to this, this crime, I was like, I'm going to tell my story, you know? And so even though this, all the publishers wanted this big celebrity takedown piece and I'm like, that's not the story. And they're like, well, we don't care about the other story. And I just kept getting rejected, but I just kept being persistent. And I thought the book would change my life, but it didn't really sell that well at all. You know, it's hard to sell a book and publishers, unless they've given you a huge advance, they're not really going to market for you. And I think I didn't know that. And so then I was like, all right, well, I got to bring in some bigger guns, you know, but there were so many people, there were so many powerful people in Hollywood that like ran Hollywood that were trying to shut this project down because they, even though I had fallen on the sword, even though I had protected people at every turn, they didn't want the story coming out. And, he, and I was like, you know what? I did a lot for other people and I'm doing this. So I made this like short list of the most successful filmmakers in Hollywood. And it was the creative people, Aaron Sorkin, Steven Spielberg, Shonda Rhimes, Catherine Bigelow. And on the top of that list for me was Aaron. Um, he was and is my favorite writer. He's the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood. So that as a gambler, that those are, you know, that's a good horse to bet on. And so I just started to try to get to him. And most people laughed me out of their office. And I was just persistent. And, you know, finally I got a meeting with Aaron. And I remember before I walked in, I was like, my legs were shaking and I had this moment of like, my God, I'm 35 years old, millions of dollars in debt, a convicted felon, social pride, and I live with my mom. Like, what am I doing going to pitch Aaron Sork in my story? When you put it like that. And then <laughs> I was like, fuck it. Like, I'm, I'm doing it. Well, you let's know? face it. You had nothing to lose. And <laughs> everything yeah, to gain. Yeah, nothing to lose, That's what right? I always say. Like, that's That's the best. Like, you're just fearless, and you don't have an ego, and you're like, can you get me the meeting or not? I don't really need your opinion. Right. Yeah. So I walked in and I, you know, I kind of had to put a game face on. And when I was done, Aaron said the funniest thing to me. He said, um, well, I'll tell you one thing, kid, I have never met someone so down in their luck and so full of themselves. <laughs> and I was like, we're back. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. And that is, um, by the way, that is one of the biggest lessons too. I've always said business is the art of bullshit. And if you, people say to me, where do you get your confidence from? And I think if we could just teach women that it, it, confidence doesn't, 100%. it comes from within. There is nowhere, you can't learn confidence. Confidence actually is something the most unconfident people teach themselves to do because, you know, I didn't feel confident at school. People laughed at me and were horrible to me and all of these things. So I had to yeah. like teach myself to walk into the room and go, look, you know, you're going to listen to me. And that's what yeah. I do. Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think it's a matter of bringing that logos of control within, right? Like, you know, it, I think in this book I'm writing is, on effective presence, which is the science of how you make people feel. And I think very rarely people, before they walk into a room, they ask themselves the question, how am I gonna, what kind of emotional footprint am I gonna leave on this room, on this person? Like how are my actions, my words, my tone, you know, my style of communication, like what kind of emotional impact is that gonna have on people? I think, we're, we're, we're too focused on our, you know, like not in a, I'm not saying this, like we're maliciously selfish, but we're like, okay, is my outfit okay? Like, um, that I, you know, what are my talking points? Like, and it's like, none of that really matters. It's that Maya Angelou quote, people are going to forget what you said and what you did, and they're not going to forget the way you made them feel. And I think back to basics, getting back to that, demonstrating real empathy, you know, and real empathy is, the ability to listen to someone who you don't agree with, you know, it's not the feeling sorry for the shelter dog. We all do that, you know, and then, you know, also deep listening, which is listening to discover, not listening to respond or, or, or getting out of this idea that every relationship needs to be transactional and it's a zero sum game um, and becoming authentically curious about human beings and, and, you know, like, 
if you can nail having a positive effect of presence, which is leaving a positive uh, emotional footprint on the world, it changes everything. I mean, that is the through line of my success for sure. Okay, so Molly, what is next for Molly Bloom? Like, I mean, I can't <laughs> see you just hiking in Colorado with your two-year-old. Please tell me <laughs> that you have some, those, like you're little. turning Colorado into some sort of like, I don't know, God, I, I dread to think. What, what, what are you doing? So um, I'm writing this book, Effective Presence, which is so brilliant. Not, not my book. I mean, I hope my book is brilliant, but this science and it really is an adjunct or an improvement on emotional intelligence mm -hmm. because the way that emotional intelligence stands right now, it prescribes you to be aware of your own emotions and then to try to be aware of the person's emotional state in front of you. And to do that by reading faces, reading body language, and recently, a bunch of social scientists, and I, I knew deeply that reading people is incredibly unreliable because I watched thousands of hours of people play poker and those people that thought they could just read everyone lost. And the people that focused on the probability and the data won. And then when I started speaking on stages, I would get on stage and I would be like, this audience hates me. Like they are gonna get up and walk out. And then they'd be like crying or like an audience, I would be like, I got, I got them in the palm of my hand. And they'd be like, I'd get like a complaint, you know? So I'm like, people's facial expressions, like they're, it's not reflective. And so this group of social scientists found that if you're relying on reading people through these uh, measurements, you're gonna be wrong conservatively 65% of the time. Here are the two exceptions. If you know someone well, obviously the, the error rate goes down. And some people are just really good guessers. But what's so cool about effective presence is it's the list of what you can do to evoke positive emotional experiences from people. And then you memorize it and you follow that. Versus like me with my emotionally traumatized complex mind trying to read your emotionally traumatized complex mind, you know? And so I think it's important. I think it's really hard. I think connection is this sort of dying art. And what this is about is really how to connect and impact in a real way. Um, the, next, the, uh, the next thing I'm working on is building a community and support and resources and really like good information for moms. Um, I will tell you this right now. I have... 11 fused vertebrae and I decided to be a mogul skier and I made the US ski team. I was beaten up by the mob, arrested by the feds. Um, I did nine rounds of IVF and there is nothing, nothing that is harder than being a mom. I don't care what anyone says. And this, you know, I, my husband and I broke, we separated when I was two months pregnant and I was, you know, a single mom, I was 43 when my daughter was born and the experience and, and the, the weight of it all and the loneliness of, of it all brought me to my knees. And so, you know, this is why it's like, who knows what's going to happen in life? Like who knows what's going to impact you and affect you. And, and so, you know, I want to teach moms to be powerful. I want to teach moms to be able to um, you, you know, use their voice or, or have agency or at least dictate the outcome of their life. And it's like, I don't care if you're a stay at home mom, or if you want to be president, like, I don't care. I just want, I want people in this position, women in this position to have community. I want them to have, um, validity. And I, you know, I, I want to impart and share the things that I've learned um, cause I had to like go through this whole healing, like sort of rebuilding process after I had Fiona in a big way. So also very difficult. I think being in a very, very masculine world 
and living this high octane life to just staying at home. You see, I found it incredibly hard as a mom when I had a big company at the time Did too. You? Yeah. I, I can imagine. I yeah, just couldn't do it. It's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. And I, you know, everyone else is sort of telling me how many day, times a day my their daughter is pooped or they're sitting there doing the airplane. I don't think, I, I think I changed about two nappies and fed them once. <laughs> and, you know, I hated so every minute of it. It's just, it was just not for me. But everyone told me it should be for me. And that's the thing. So, you know, I wanted to have it all. And that's where I think women haven't, been taught I think we've been taught you're either a mother and a good one mm -hmm. or you're a terrible mm -hmm. person and you're a bit you know you you gave up everything and you hate your children and that's just not true I love my children but you know I need a life at the same time and one million percent and that's like an incredible thing to do for your children incredible because thing to do for your children because it shows uh, your I children what yeah. a what a proper life is and that you know yeah. I get a lot of shit for it and I would like to say that you know having got a daughter I hope that she works all the way through I don't want her to give up her life for her children nor should she and by the way if men want you to sort of you know cook dinner and do all of these things they'd better be you know doing half the work with the kids and the everything else why do women go to work and then have to provide everything at home unless of course he's paying every single bill that comes through the door then we'll talk but other than that you know it's a it, too much. It, it's too much for anyone um, and, and you get pulled in so many directions. So I absolutely love this project. Uh, if there's any room or you need yeah. any help, please do contact yeah. me because I'm very, I mean, I'm uh, totally as down. As soon as we, we set up the mentor, it, it's all, it'll all be in app and the program will be like already sort of like figured out. You can always deviate from it, but I would love for you to mentor. I mean, it's just like, just to have somebody that you can consult with, you know, that, that like has your back. Because also so many moms go at each other. It's like, guess what? Breastfeeding is great and formula is great. It's only moms it's that go at each other. That's women beat up women. It's shocking. You never hear a man yeah. going, look at that mother over there. She's not breastfeeding. Never. No. No, it's women judging it's like, women, which is so sad. No. And I say it a lot. They always do. It's like instead of cheering each other on, and I wish that that can change, that, you know, I, and that's what, Molly, I think your story is so, so inspiring. And I, again, obviously, I'm not telling everyone to go out there and do anything illegal. But what I am saying is it's a mindset of like, I can do anything. Yeah. And I, that yeah. the resilience of that, you went from, you know, and, and being able to pursue and not stop and not give up and to make this happen for yourself in any which way, there is no excuse for women not to take life by the balls today. There just isn't. Um, and I think... And whatever that looks like for them, right? Like if you want to marry the richest guy or if you go want for it. to start your own company, like let's all be for it. I mean, it's... We whatever sh you we choose. We need to stop taking each other down. You want to go and, you know, do what I did, marry a 24-year-old, off you go. You want to go and like, you know, d run a run your, your local game, off you go. Go, you can do anything today, you know? I mean, yeah. and that's, the, that's the beauty of life. It really is the beauty of life. And I think one thing that I heard all the way through uh, talking to you tonight has been, you know, mind over matter and talking to yourself. And I've always done that, helicopter yourself. Yeah. There's nobody like your yeah. own inner voices to help you get through life. Molly, it, I yep. could talk to you for hours, honestly. Um, it's been fascinating. You're an amazing, amazingly uh, resilient, clever, well-spoken woman. Um, and, you know, even though it went a bit left, I can see how it happened. So thank you um, for joining me today. I've really, really enjoyed speaking and meeting you. I have too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another um, episode of Uncut and Uncensored with Caroline Stanbury. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Thank you.